So hello, everyone. I think we are going to go ahead and get started. My name is Claire Finan, and I am the program coordinator at Parktown Place and program director at InLiquid. We are so happy to have you all with us here virtually tonight to join us for this artist talk with Karen Friedman and Gary Spoka. Before we begin, I would like to thank our hosts at Parktown Place Museum District Residences and aim to Premier property located on the Benjamin Franklin property. Friedman and Spilka both have works in the permanent collection at Park Town Place. Beyond sharing works in Park Town Place's permanent collection, Friedman and Spilka's work connect in their use of bright geometric and often abstract patterns. So for tonight's talk, we're gonna be starting with Karen Friedman, who is recognized for her vibrant abstract geometric paintings that explored the interaction of color and its ability to alter perception. She began her formal art training studying jewelry design at the University of the Arts in Philadelphia and graphic design at the Tyler School of Art. Friedman then went on to build a successful graphic design business followed by her immersion in the fine arts. Gary Spilka has been trained as an artist, a social scientist, an architect, and an urban planner. And it is not surprising that Spilka's Fabric Works continues to investigate themes grounded in these ways of knowing the world. She has been making pieced fabric and dye painted and printed constructions for over 12 years. So for tonight's talk, Karen will go first and then Gary. Uh, and at the end, there will be time for questions from the audience. We do ask that you submit these questions through the chat function. And so for those of you who are unfamiliar with Zoom, if you kind of wiggle your mouse over the screen of Zoom, you'll see a bar uh, pop up on the bottom and there should be a chat function. And you can type any questions in and I will read them and ask them to Karen and, and Gary at the end. So we're gonna start with Karen and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so you can share your presentation. Hello. Wait a minute. Why did that? Hi. Welcome. And obviously, I'm Karen Friedman. I never picked up a paintbrush until I was in my late 40s. As you've been told, um, I was a jewelry major at PCA, which was what it used to be called. Um, I've always loved tools and working with my hands. When I was a kid, my parents could drop me off in the hardware department at Sears and I would be in heaven. After college, I realized that I could not make a living as a jewelry designer, not in the fine art way that we were taught. And since I was the world's worst waitress, I enrolled at Tyler and studied graphic design. I had a successful freelance business for many, many years. At 48 years old, I decided to try painting and took some continuing ed classes, uh, first at Woodmere and then over to Papa. I've always been drawn to geometric forms, which is pretty ironic considering I flunked geometry in high school. And I didn't do too well in color theory in college either. But in college, I did start collecting books on quilts. And I have no concrete reason why I'm drawn to quilts or the grid and patterns, but they just keep cropping up in my work. I love doing puzzles. It's a kind of a Zen thing that relaxes me. So when I hit that point in a painting where I think I might overwork it, I take a break, get my iPad out and solve cryptograms. I kind of think of it as my mental sorbet. It cleanses my mind and allows me to see my work more objectively. Doing puzzles taught me to approach the creative process as a game also. I actually never expected to be anything more than a housewife who paints, but that's not what happened. When my work started to get noticed, I began to apply to juried shows and showing in group exhibitions. I also thought it would be a good idea to learn the business side of art, so I took a job as a gallery assistant at a gallery in Old City. It was there that I discovered encaustic. 
we represented an artist who worked in encaustic and I just loved it. I fell in love with it. It checked all my boxes. I could paint, I could work um, with color and I got to use tools. So I could scrape it, I could smooth it, I could layer it. I think it's an incredibly versatile and, and sensual medium. It exudes the warmth and translucency that begs you to touch it. It shows that I've been in, I've noticed people with their hands at their side, quivering, controlling the urge to touch the painting. Now, for those who aren't familiar with encaustic, it is a wax-based paint made up of beeswax, resin, and pigment. It's kept on a molten palette, a heated palette, um, and applied to an absorbent surface. Then you reheat it so that the layer you just put down fuses to the layer at the, underneath it. Otherwise, the whole painting would start flaking off like file ago. When I first began to take myself seriously as a working artist, I knew it was important to develop a continuity in the work to create a series. But it took me a while to grasp the whole concept of a series. How do you do the same thing at over and over and not get bored? I did figure it out and now I wouldn't work any other way. Instead of finding it constraining, I find it freeing. I challenge myself to explore the crap out of it and then push it as far as I can. That's, that's where the game begins for me. I spent a few years painting mostly organic work while playing around with encaustic. But my first series was born when I finally found my voice and the grid with my reclamation series. Uh, a foreword or preface, a majority of the encaustic paintings that you are going to see here are all wax. There are no collage inlays or anything like that. So um, the Reclamation series was originally inspired by pixelated images. Um, so in addition to the combination of hard edge and organic elements, I was also interested in exploring the characteristics of encaustic in a way I had never seen done before. I wanted to create work that would showcase the inherent qualities of the medium the way it interacted and refracted light, the way it creates depth, exudes warmth, and its luminosity. I wanted the medium to be as much a part of the painting as the imagery and the composition and the palette that I chose. Installation in my powder room. There was a juried show titled Beauty and Its Opposites, and it got me to thinking about veils and hiding behind them. So I started playing around with translucent overlays and their ability to disguise or transform. Installation at James Oliver Gallery in 2009. After a few years with the Reclamation series, I felt I had said all there was to say about what I was doing, and I was looking for something new to explore. The Kaleidoscoptical series was my response to submit work for a juried exhibition, here we go again, um, whose theme was the honeybee. At that time, I was just beginning to explore symmetrical repetitions. I decided to interpret the exhibition's theme by using a hexagonal repeat, which was inspired by the beehive and the honeycomb. The series was originally titled Rouge, which is French for beehive. But every time somebody looked at one of the paintings, they would say, oh, it looks like a kaleidoscope. And so I renamed the series because I figured if that's what people were gonna call it, that's what they were gonna Google. And I did keep the word rouge in the painting titles though. I've always been surprised at how I, I see people with their noses like three inches from the face of a painting. As a result, it became important for me to create work that would read differently when viewed up close or at a distance. Yet, when I first saw the thumbnail of this painting, it was like I had to do a double take because I thought, 
that's not the painting, because there was an entirely different painting there. The shift in perception was entirely the result of scale and the way the colors interacted with the pattern. That observation inspired the four criterion for kaleidoscopical. The paintings had to be different close up and far away. They had to be generated from a single pattern. <clears throat> they must appear different when viewed together. And I had to do all of that <clears throat> strictly through the interaction of color. All of these paintings are based on the same, are used the same pattern. I hope that the large and small images in each of the slides here um, replicates the experience of standing close up or far away from the painting. Within the series, I've created groups of paintings and the paintings in each of those group use, share a pattern. This was my favorite pattern though, and most of my paintings are with this one. This is uh, installation at James Gallery in Pittsburgh in 2013. Started to play with overlays again. Okay, this is a new pattern. Same new pattern. Third new pattern. With the Kaleidoscopical series, I began using my computer to sketch and develop my patterns. I found it so much faster to experiment with the interactions of color that way. I also needed to use it to create the stencils of the patterns that I use to apply the encaustic. This is the pattern of that first group of paintings that I showed you. So each painting <clears throat> needs about six or seven stencils. Once I divided the original matrix, <coughs> excuse me, into individual stencils, I would send each layer to a cutter plotter that would cut the stencils out of mylar. <coughs> mylar is able to withstand the heat needed to fuse each layer of encaustic to the previous layer. I could get multiple uses out of each stencil and I could see my work. But best of all, Cutting stencils this way saved me time and it gave me perfectly registered stencils to create my layers. Color mixing is a huge chunk of my process. Because my paintings are so dependent on the interaction of color, it's important for me to get them right. Each painting has 25 to 35 colors. I began the habit of recording the recipes for each of these colors and I made labels for the tins. I made a color swatch chart. And most importantly, every color, I made a little cake of the color for every single color in that painting that stayed, that I file away. So if the painting should become damaged in the future, I can match the, the color exactly because I would never ever be able to, to mix it again. Okay, here's an image of me fusing. I don't know if you can see, but it's, there's the, the uh, stencil on top. <clears throat> okay, the paintings basically have two layers. This is a finished first layer with the elements that I laid down <clears throat> with the stencil. And here's a detail, to maybe you'll see more dimension that way. This is, this was prepared now for the second layer. So I would fill in with clear encaustic and scrape it back till it was really smooth. And this is what happens when things go wrong and you cry. And I don't know why it went wrong. <clears throat> the following two paintings use the same pattern, but instead of a mandala-like composition, I offset the pattern. And these are my two paintings that are 
in the permanent collection of park templates. These share a pattern also. Um, this is <clears throat> show at, J at Space Gallery in Denver in 2015. So you'll get to see a bit more about scale. The smallest ones are 12 by 12. Qualia, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm gonna take a sip. Um, I came across this word accidentally, but it embodied exactly how I hope my paintings would be experienced. The Wikipedia definition is, in the philosophy and certain models of psychology, qualia, which is the plural of quali, are defined as individual instances of subjective conscious experience. More simply put, it's the way we see things are, are on our own, the way we perceive things. And it changed from minute to minute, but it's ours. Five years ago, I started experimenting with acrylic. I wanted to work larger, and the work I created in encaustic could only be done at a smaller scale. I expected acrylic was going to be an, an additional medium, but it turned out I developed arthritis in my thumbs from 10 years of scraping my encaustic paintings. When it got to the point I couldn't hold the paintbrush anymore, I thought there was time for a change. I originally was applying the paint um, to the canvas just the way, you know, the way you see it, but I really was bothered by the coldness and the plasticity of the hard edge after spending years looking at the warmth of my hard edge designs um, in wax. So to bring a sense of warmth to these paintings, I decided to apply acrylic paint in a scumbling fashion, which you won't see for another two paintings. Um, but I did that over a dark underpainting. And I think the graininess creates a warmth and approachability to the hard edge of the geometric pattern. This is me before I went gray with one of my paintings that is part of the permanent collection at Temple University. Now with the Qualia series, I'm obviously still working with pattern, but without all of the criteria of the kaleidoscopical series. But I am still using the interaction of color to create depth and a push-pull effect. Uh, two other paintings that are part of the permanent collection at Temple University. And probably the first example you see of my scumbling. This is that painting, I stole it, um, Abington Art Center. This shows a detail of that. And that is the same pattern, different colors. It's an installation on my studio wall. Okay, so my acrylic paintings have between 70 and 100 colors in them. And so I've continued my practice of labeling, writing, making recipes and all that. After creating the final design on the computer, I break it into a grid. I give each element in the grid um, a number and that goes on the paint cup. Um, and I print something out that shows me where the colors go and where to tape. I learned um, after by trial and error that dots help me visualize better where I'm supposed to be painting because when you only see one fourth of the painting at a time, it's really, you, it's disorienting. And voila, that's the finished painting. This is um, at Wayne Art Center in 2018. This is my dining room. Another of, of, of setting up the pattern in a different way. That's the before and after. 
um, another manipulating the same pattern. Uh, this is my latest show at Space Gallery in 2019. And um, I created coloring pages for parents that were going crazy during quarantine, and it's available free as a free download from my website. So thank you very much for coming and for listening. And I'm done. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, that's great. As a, a reminder for everyone, if you have any questions for either Karen or um, Gary, you can go ahead and use the chat function at the bottom of your screen to type them out, and I will ask them on your behalf at the end of the talk. So next up, we have Gary Spoka. Does that work? Is that good? Work. Great. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, I recognize some faces and names, so good to see you. Well, I'll tell you a little bit about myself um, because clearly there's a throughway to the influences of my work. Um, I was born in New York and I was part of a very large extended network of um, people that would get together as a family every weekend. Uh, we uh, socialized together, we went away together. It was a lot of people all the time. So people were very important to me at a young age. Um, I was one of these students that was very much a science uh, a freak as a kid. You know, we, I went to school at a time when science was really uh, getting pumped up. But I also was a, a, a really um, active art student as well. And I went to college initially, I went to Carnegie Mellon for uh, biology, got caught up a lot in politics, uh, took a lot of art courses, but graduated with a degree in psychology. I don't know if I have any people in the audience, but the, this was the time when you could really dabble around and define your own major. Um, I eventually came to Philadelphia for a master's in clinical psych at Temple, but really put my feet down in architecture and planning after I studied architecture at Penn. Um, following that, I uh, pursued a career of uh, focusing on urban planning and redevelopment issues, but uh, through the uh, avenues of advising nonprofits and philanthropy across the country. So I have a very non-linear non path. I somehow discovered, I can't even remember how I got into it, I discovered quilts through a friend actually, in the early 90s and started working on traditional quilt making, but with a modern twist to it. But then came across the work of uh, Nancy Crow, who worked very intuitively, worked off the grid and uh, moved away from traditional uh, pattern work. So in some ways, Karen, your work is more visually quilt-like than mine is today. Um, I'm, I'm very much a passion, passionate urbanist, and a lot of my influence comes from observing and being, walking around, enjoying the streets, the buildings, and watching people in, in Philadelphia or other cities where I've traveled. Um, Influence have been um, advisors in architecture school, Nancy Crow, but I have to say, I have been looking at art for 50 years. And um, I've always been attracted to uh, contemporary people, but 
lately, um, I would say big influences have been uh, Jean Arp, uh, Louise Bourgeois, who also works a lot with textiles, Ellsworth Kelly, uh, Mary Heilman, I don't know if you know, Palaio, the architect, and graffiti artists. So, um, okay. Materials I work with are fabric. Okay. I, I uh, am a piecer. I am a printer on fabric. I am a painter. And I'm going to go through how I work on these different materials. But I have to say, I love the feel of fabric. Particularly, I work with cottons because the way you can work with the dyes, you can get an amazing luminosity from real saturation. Um, textiles fabric also gives you a great opportunity for um, enormous different kinds of texture and I think quilting you'll see some of the pieces close up you'll see the texture in them. Um, I really also enjoy the fact that textiles or fabric a lot of what I work with is cotton is very accessible to other people. You'll see that um, I'm not a traditional quilter, but a lot of people have an association with a quilt somehow in their family and very much get it when they see my work, but they also have a lot of experience with textiles and fabric and we all wear clothing made of fabric. We're housed amid fabric. So it often is a way for people to um, you know, tap their own experiences and memories. So this, what you see right here, is the beginning of pieced work. Now, how I start is usually uh, deciding on a palette. And um, today, and it wasn't so much the case for these pieces, but in 2014, I was buying fabrics, commercial fabrics, but today I dye my own palette. And I'll give you a better idea of that at a later point. But um, it's given me a much richer color vocabulary. And it's really, it's, it's pretty amazing. I feel like an alchemist when I start uh, putting the dye in and letting it cure. So. So I, I work on uh, dyeing in the summer because heat is great for uh, the dyes to really do their maximum um, take up and great for the luminosity. I typically work in um, a handful of shapes, although these are extending and it, it expanding. The piece you see, the black blue in the, on the white ball is eight by eight feet. I tended to work large for a very long time. I have about 35 pieces that are about this scale. And you know, to get up and down to post these pieces, trial them, you have to get on a step stool. So I trial and error different shapes, different colors, and then move in on the detail. You'll see some of that on the left. I often photograph in between and see what I like. I, you know, sometimes I'll move things around and go back to another version. So once it's designed, I'll sew it together. And then I will uh, work with a quilter to quilt it. I do not do the quilting myself. I, you need a very large machine and it's extremely repetitive. It's not how I want to spend my time. So I delineate how I want to work with her on it on um, some photos. So the predominance of my work uh, tends to be piecing. And um, only did I move to what's known as surface design, printing or painting about four years ago, but I still piece also. Okay. Here's an example of uh, a piece work. This is 103 inches across by eight foot high. This is um, conversations uh, um, on meaning. 
This is actually recently, was re recently per purchased by the International Quilt Museum and Study Center in Lincoln, Nebraska. This is the piece that is at Parktown Place. It's actually not the whole thing. The whole piece is eight by eight, but you can see the um, texture of the quilting, which is done in a kind of a periwinkle thread on top of the red. It's very tight quilting. Okay, here's an example of printing and painting. Now, the piece up on top left is the size of a table that I work on. I'll stretch a pre-treated piece of fabric on a table that's eight foot long by four feet wide. It's been soaked in soda ash. And I'll print through a silk screen with an impression on it that I've made before in this case. It's a lattice uh, plastic fencing and create shapes of one form or another. Um, I, I use a um, paint roller with an exert a lot of pressure. I don't pull through the screen the way, you know, a silk screener would. Sometimes my pieces are a whole cloth. Other times I'll cut them up and reconfigure them and, and, and actually intentionally make a series of units while I'm um, printing. In this case, I took the piece on the bottom left there and then started finding what I wanted out of it in shapes. The piece on the right was several iterations of painting on top of the shapes with thickened dye paste, which is like an agar kelp type solution uh, with um, an acid dye. Here is the final piece. I'll go in in detail and then delineate how I want the quilting. And this piece has been quilted, you can see as well. So this is four, uh, four feet by four feet. And probably painted over several times to get the color intensity. This is an example of just direct painting. And I started this, as you can see, in four different pieces. I painted with um, a car washing mitt, a th dye, thickened dye paste on pre-treated fabric, and then started, you know, cutting up and sewing pieces together, just with the black outlines. And then I started filling in with other um, colors. But again, you'll see, you know, if you take a good look, I don't know if you can tell, but there are multiple layers of dye to get the color intensity. And then I um, put it on um, a backing, a thick backing of like a cushiony material and did some stitching in those thinner black lines. So it's, it, it's um, I guess, uh, considered a quilt, but it's really, you know, it's uh, more a different approach. Okay, what are the generating and points, ideas, and influence of my work? Well, you see, I had a very uh, varied pathway uh, towards getting where I got to be. And, you know, I, I love to study, as you can see as well. I, I spent a lot of time in um, higher ed. All these points of view, I think, have still stayed with me and influence how I approach my world. So initially, a lot of my work had a lot of landform influences. Um, and I should say, when I was doing these pieces in front of you, I could not sew curves. So I just sewed rectilinear, you know, linear forms. And I think of these as aerial views of maps, even highly influenced by the grid of uh, Philadelphia. Um, <clears throat> and I did a whole series of these. I too work in a series. I, I can go with something up to 30, 35 pieces. And then when I run out of steam, I, I do move on to something else. I can't always predict of what, how long the series will be. Here's conversations on the meaning of life. The other thing that has been um, an influence for me are interactions of figures with other figures. 
I really think of these as um, abstract figurative creatures and I see them gesturing, talking to, interacting with. Um, one thing that is very common to my work is very strong uh, biomorphic figure with a very strong negative space as well. I really, I really enjoy taking delight in negative space. Uh, here are two pieces that to me uh, reflect uh, my interest in people, but uh, on the right, you'll see a piece that uh, was done last year in the winter when I was taking courses, um, uh, drawing courses at Fleischer um, and uh, doing nude model drawing. And I, I did these drawing pieces with uh, the car wash and then colored them, at, colored them in with uh, dye paint and kind of look for these geometric shapes. Uh, the piece on the left is a monoprint and then uh, with lines painted over it. So, so the body is, is uh, really a fascination to me and a, a point of inspiration. But I have to say, uh, similar to Karen, I'm very turned on by materials and learning how to make different materials uh, work for me. Um, but work for me and how I want to use them. And it takes a while sometimes to find my way with, with uh, new materials, although it's all within the fabric um, vocabulary. So the other thing that inspires me and I step off from is color. A lot of the work that I do, and, and probably all of us do as artists, is really tedious. So for me, I find that I have to work with colors that carry me through and inspire me through and give me energy through the, the um, tedious, slow, painful process of construction and, and, and the making. So what do I want the viewer to experience? Well, I, I, I feel everybody comes with their own history and their own perceptions and their own point of view. So I can't predict what the viewer would experience, but I hope I communicate through um, the scale of some of my work, uh, a deep experience of being in the work and almost a visceral, if not a direct visceral and evocative personal identification of trying to figure out what's going on in there. What are these? things or creatures and um, really experience the movement and the uh, joy that I have largely in making the work. But you never know what people really come away with. Um, the other thing I should say a lot about my work, I'm a very direct person, I think simply. I try to communicate maybe two, three ideas at, at a time in a piece. Um, when Karen and I were talking about working together in this presentation, we said, well, you know, we do have something experience. We're mature women in life. We've been through a lot of experiences. And in my opinion, age has a lot of advantages for an artist. Um, I feel an enormous urgency of time in my um, point right now of, of uh, being an artist. I, I'm so grateful that I was able to, and I am able to devote this full-time life to it at this point. The more I work, the more I, I generate new ideas. So, so I just keep on wanting to you know, work at it. Um, so I think age gives me a sense of urgency and just putting, it, putting the work out there, I'm less critical. I also consider it play. I'm um, able to be able to do this in some great space, great studio space right now. And I enjoy just getting down to it. The other thing that I think for me experience has really helped me out with is that I spent 35 years running a business and realizing that um, I, I enjoy running a business. So I appreciate the aspect of uh, Art, 
art business. I, I enjoy marketing, I enjoy the promotion, I enjoy meeting new people. Um, and um, I, you know, presenting my work, figuring out what the value is and, and understanding what the art market's about. I'm still figuring it out. But um, there are advantages to uh, being a little older, but there, one, one disadvantage is I don't seem to have the stamina that I did when I was 30, but I, I do work to keep in shape. I think that's really critical, but, um, and, Having help when you, 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 know, you need it is really something worthwhile to have. So here's another piece. Um, I think to me, I call this girl on fire and, and that's very much how I feel at this phase in my life. So what am I working on now? Well, the pieces that you see in front of me um, are um, a collaboration that I happen to really delightfully have with uh, a light artist in upstate New York and uh, the Schweinfurth Art Center in, um, around the Finger Lake area, just outside of Syracuse. This fellow does lighting for rock stars, but with COVID-19, he had no business for a while and he approached the head of the museum. And he said, well, let's figure out something to do. I can, I can you know, really bring your work to the outside and let's let's try to do something. So there was um, a month of, of uh, light windows sponsored by the Holographic Society for the month of, of June. He said, do you know anybody whose work is very graphic? So they immediately identified me and this has been up all of May and will be up all of June. Uh, it's a rotating exhibit of my work, which moves, dissolves, shifts, and evolves. So it's been a thrill to do this. I've been trying to get my art off the wall because I really do like large scale work. The other thing that came to me was um, by surprise was uh, I, I'm participating, actually I have some banners in the reopening of Center City, uh, May by the Center City District in Philadelphia. I've been piecing right now. This is an example of my new palette, and uh, this is about four by four feet. Um, I'm trying to do a lot of different things at one time so they can speak to each other and inform each other. Here's some new pieced work. I'm trying to make some smaller work also that could be uh, more accessible to collectors because these large pieces really are rather expensive. I've been painting with dye painting. Here are some new series, early series of shapes and um, actually just with a brush. And I've been uh, working with some new print approaches, a different stencil and um, experimenting with it. Here's some you know, quick and dirty examples. And as I said, uh, this is a great time to be dying because the heat of the summer is beneficial for uh, dyeing fabrics. And this is my, oh, I, I call her Betty, my machine Betty. It's a Maytag washer that I use to dye my uh, fabrics. That's what I'm up to. So. Um, I like being in touch with other artists or just curious people, so feel free to drop me an email, look at my work on Instagram, or check out my website. So, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so, while we are waiting for a few more questions to come in, um, I am going to start with some of my own. Um, I didn't realize in, in working with both of you and setting this up um, that both of you are, I don't want to say was your second career, but you kind of both committed to yourselves to it full time later in life. Mm -hmm. um, and Gary, you, you especially touched on this, um, but I, I was curious, you know, if you saw advantages to this, um, you know, if, if you feel like being older made you bolder and more willing to invest? Um, or if you have any regrets about not making this your, your first career? 
Well, I would say I'm not a kind of person that has regrets. I, I loved what I did before too, let me tell you. I traveled all over the US. I met some amazing people inspiring, really important social change. And I loved it until I didn't anymore. <laughs> and you know, I, I was running a business of about anywhere from 20 to 30 people. And um, so I have no regrets. I just want, I wish I could live forever now. <laughs> um, it does make me bolder. You know, I don't care about anybody else, frankly. I'm doing this for me, so. And then Karen, do you, do you have thoughts on that? Um, I echo the doing it for me thing. Um, it's, I don't think I would have been as good in my early 20s. I think I was too fearful. I worried about what people thought. I, it's, this is a great time. And, and it's, it's just very, very freeing. So. Great. So Karen, um, Larry from the audience does have a question for you. He is curious about what software tools do you use to create your stencil patterns? Um, I use Adobe Illustrator. And sorry for the side thing, I've got two screens going on and it's fine. Um, I use Adobe Illustrator and one of the great things about it is I can, with the cutter plotter that I had bought, I can design it in there and directly send it to it. Not everything works with a Mac, not all of these machines do. Um, but that's what I do, Adobe Illustrator. Do you know, oh, can I interrupt here? There is a quilt program called EQ, Electric Quilter. Mm -hmm. And um, I used to design traditional quilts uh, uh, with um, a program that looks very much like your patterns. And you can you know, put all these different kinds of fabrics in. I don't know, you might find it fun to play with, actually. Great. Uh, and so a reminder for everyone, if you have questions, feel free to type them into the chat bar. Um, so I, I had another question for myself. Um, both of you kind of talked about uh, making new work that was more financially accessible. Um, and I'm just curious about how you feel about that and if that is kind of for necessity, or if that's like an exciting new way to work, and just what your your general feelings are. You can go first. Okay, um, it's not a necessity. Um, it's just, um, I don't know. I mean, I just I'm doing it because I want to share my work, and it it not affordable for everyone. So that's you know that's why I I really didn't show it, but the paintings. The pictures, the things behind me are work that I'm doing on aluminum now. I'm, um, images that I shot, um, I'm printing them on a, on a limited edition on aluminum for sale. And uh, definitely cheaper, so more affordable. So. For me, um, but I also started working smaller to experiment. I hadn't pieced for about four years, so I thought maybe I lost it. So I started piecing again small, and I wanted to find my way to a different way of working, a freer way of working. So I, I started working small. I figured, you know, it's easier to risk. Piecing can be very, for me, uptight. And um, I found, you know, I wanted to find my way to more joy with it again. I, I just, you know, I burned out, I think, after making 30, 35 of these really large pieces. So that, you know, so, so, uh, so that's one aspect of it. The other thing too, I feel like there are a lot of, I have a lot of young people that are interested in my artwork. And um, I think I have a stronger young audience than anything. And, you know, the, they'd love a big piece, but they can't quite afford it. So I thought, um, I actually have a good friend who is a metal smither. I traveled around with her a bit about a year and a half ago, and they had a line, she was with another jeweler, they had a line that was um, kind of a production line. And I thought, 
That's a great idea. You know, you can build clients' interests with, uh, at lower investment in sort of a way. So I thought, you know, that's, that's really, that's a great idea. The other thing that I did, I have to say, I started playing around with uh, photography prints of some of my work and sewing on them. I didn't show you those, but I have a lot of those available for, you know, $100 a piece and the kinds of color uh, copies you can get are amazing, you know, with, with certain houses and very affordable. So I think it is for accessibility and um, really trying to share my work too. I too want people to enjoy it. I have so much work, I just want to move it out too. <laughs> uh, so Gary, we have a, a question for you um, about since you outsource the, the quilting process, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. If that has been difficult with the, the status of the world in the last few months, um, and has that adjusted how you've worked on projects? No, because I work with some, I've been working with someone who's outside of DC for about 12 years. My other quilter is outside of Syracuse. So um, in order to help the quilter, well, it's a collaboration, really. I have to know the limits of her machine and what her machine can do, what she's good at. There are certain kinds of approaches that I thought someone else is better. So, so I, I delineate quite well on a photo. I detail it quite well. I have the overall concept. I, I detail out specific areas. I say what color threads I want and um, do that for each piece, I send them. I just send her the whole package. I send her the tops and I also make the backs. Sometimes she'll call me in the middle of something and she said, what did you mean for this spot? She'll hold up her computer and I'll say, I haven't a clue, I don't remember. <laughs> do what you think is best or I will remember. And um, we go back and forth, so. And then she'll send them back to me when she's done and I have to still finish them, do the binding and it's very labor intensive, so. Yeah, yeah. so um, if there are any more questions from the audience, please submit them uh, now. Um, but I would like to thank both of you so much. Uh, and again, thank Park Town Place for their, their support of our art programming, such as this artist talk. Um, and I'm so happy that we can still bring people together virtually uh, in this time where we're all so, so distant. Um, so thank you, Karen and, and Gary. And I, I think we're going to stop there for this evening. Great. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. And yes, of course. Thank you, the audience, for tuning in and, and tuning in. All right. Bye. 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 -bye.